Danny stood breathless, awaiting Mr. Hagen's certain agreement. But his eyes lighted up and a happy smile broke on his face when Mr. Hagen said, Don't let that worry you, Danny. Take your dog up in the beech woods and get yourself some sleep. Then come down. I'll have Bob Fraley give you some pointers on what he's going to do. Chapter 2. The Journey the sun rose over Sony Lonesome and hung like a burning balloon in the sky as Danny danced back up the Smoky Creek Trail. A savage, silent, head-swinging bear still roamed the wind tappy, an implacable, hating enemy of all the humans who trod there. But the bear was like the snows that piled up, the gales that roared through the forest, the occasional fire, all the things that those who lived in the wind tappy had to accept as a matter of course and deal with as best they could. The Wintappy could be a hard and lonely place, but hard as it might be, it would never again be lonely. Danny shook his whirling head, trying to range in some order the events that had brought about this miracle. He looked at the great red dog pacing beside him, and when he was safely screened by the forest, knelt to pass both arms around Red's neck and hug him tightly. To be sure, it was not his dog in the same sense that the mule, the hounds, and the four pigs were owned by his father. But as Red's caretaker, he would naturally keep the dog with him. Mr. Hagen himself had said that. Danny whirled into the clearing, waltzed with Red up the shanty steps, and burst through the door. Ross's rifle and belt of cartridges leaned beside it. A made-up pack lay on the table, and his father was lacing a pair of hiking moccasins on his bare feet. Pappy, I'm going to New York, Danny shouted. You're what? Danny sat breathless down on a chair. Red padded over, laid his head on Danny's knee, and turned his eyes to watch Ross, as though trying to fathom the welcome that he might expect from this other occupant of his new home. Outside, the four chained hounds whined uneasily, and Asa sent an ear-splitting bray screaming across the pasture. Danny tickled Red's ear, and the big setter sighed happily. Starry-eyed, Danny stared at the shaft of sunlight streaming through the open door, and his feet seemed to be carrying him step by step back up it. He was jarred back to earth by Ross's gentle, Speak sensible, boy. Yes, Pappy, I'm going to New York. That ain't sensible. But I am, Danny insisted. Mr. Higgins sending Red down there to a show. That Fraley, he's taking him, and I'm going along to watch. Sure, you're funnin' with me. I'm not. I was going to take Red back to Mr. Hagen. Instead, he lit out after that big bear that's been plaguing us for so long. I had to find him. Red run that bear right to a standstill. That dog run old majesty to a standstill? Yes, sir. I hardly believe it, Ross breathed. Go on, Danny. Red had the bear on a rock, way back in the pine valleys, Danny continued. I could have shot, but didn't on account of I knew that bear would tumble off the rock and hurt the dog. So I caught up the dog and took him back to Mr. Hagen. That Fraley, he started a fuss. Then Mr. Hagen come. He said he could see the dog wasn't hurt. Then he told me that he was starting a new kennel. And I was the one to take charge of it. First thing I got to do is go to New York and see Red in the dog show. Then I'm going to bring him back and we're going to keep him here. Ross said, that do beat all. He sat staring at the floor, but when he turned his eyes on Danny, pride and pleasure lighted them. A wandering tapper most of his life, he had settled in the wind tappy 20 years ago. He knew his own handicaps and limitations, and since Danny was born, he had striven desperately but hopelessly to give him some of the better things. Danny was not just a trapper, he was like his dead mother, with all her charm and intelligence. The pride in Ross's eyes increased. Quality, whether 
it was in a man or a dog, just couldn't be hidden. Pappy, Danny asked seriously, why do you think Mr. Hagen wants me to go? I don't know, Danny. Maybe he figures you're going to be good enough dog man to handle his dogs at them big places. Ross looked thoughtfully at his son. Danny had been a natural dog handler since boyhood. And if he could have an opportunity such as this, Ross had been around enough to know that people who handled rich men's dogs could make more money in a year than some trampers make in a lifetime. They could be somebody too. Get some sleep, boy, Ross advised. Your eyes are redder than an old coon and has been running the cricks three nights straight. I'm not tired. Of course you're not. You ain't been up but two days and two nights. If you're going to New York with Red, you got to be ready. Lie down a bit of time. Well, maybe a bit of time. Danny lay down on his bed and Red curled up beside him. Danny's hand trailed over the side of the bed, feeling the big dog's furry back and assuring himself that it was really there. Ross put the yoke across his shoulders, hung his empty honey pails on it, closed the door softly behind him, and went into the woods. Danny woke with a start. The smell of frying pork chops tickled his nose. Red was sitting in the doorway, happy tail thumping the floor. Ross stood over the kitchen stove, turning pork chops into the skillet, and the long shades of evening were stealing across the clearing in the beech woods. Danny sprang out of bed and looked at the window. It's night! Sure, Ross grinned, for a man who wasn't tired. You did right well. That big red dog has been sitting there watching me for the whole hour I've been home. I think he would have bit me if I'd woke you. Red trotted back to Danny, buried his muzzle in Danny's cupped hand and sniffed. Danny looked away and Red bumped his forehead gently against Danny's wrist, demanding more attention. Ross looked proudly from Danny to the dog and his eyes drank in all the things that a born dog man will see in a fine dog. He's gonna be the best varmint dog we ever had, Danny, he first pr finally pronounced. Varmint dog? Sure. You ain't just gonna keep him in the house. That dog's got a hunt. It's born in him. I reckon you're right, Pappy. Danny swung out of bed, crossed the floor to the two tin pails that stood on a wooden shelf and poured a basin full of water. He washed his face and hands and tried to bring from among the thoughts in his mind one that sought expression, but he could not quite find it. Red, a varmint dog. Of course he would be a very good one, or he never could have bayed Old Majesty. A frown crossed Danny's brow, and he sat down to eat the fried potatoes and chops his father had prepared. Red caught a piece of meat tossed to him and swallowed it daintily. Ross watched him. I'm right proud, he said, to have a dog like that around. He's going to do a lot for us, Danny. I reckon he is. Yes, sir, Ross said profoundly. We'll get more varmints in year, this year than we ever had before. Is Mr. Hagen going to pay you anything for his keep? Gee, I don't know. He needn't, Ross observed. Such a dog will pay for his own keep and ours too. By the way, one of Mr. Hagen's hired men was up here about two hours past. He wants you should bring the dog down come morning so you can go to New York. He did? Then I guess we're really going after all. You sure are. You'll see a heap of sights in New York, Danny. I come close to going there once for a pelt man, but I couldn't abide in a city. I couldn't either. I know it, Danny, but you can go there sometime without hurting, without hurting you. If you're finished, take your dog out and get him acquainted. I'll wash the dishes. With Red trailing at his heels, Danny walked through the door into the evening twilight. The four chained hounds sulked beside their kennels. Old Mike, leader of the pack, raised his lips to discern long fangs. Red trotted stiffly up and Mike came stiffly forward. The two dogs sniffed noses and Mike, who knew a superior when he met one, sat down to watch with mournful eyes while Red nosed around an inviting patch of briar. A rabbit burst out of them 
and went scooting toward the forest with Red in close pursuit. Forgetting their resentment, the four hounds bade thunderous encouragement. Oor, oor, oor. The rabbit dived into a hole beneath a pile of rocks. Danny watched critically. <laughs> it was an amateurish exhibition in a way. Red had a good nose but lacked experience. Old Mike would have known that the rabbit was faster than he and would have worked out a ruse to try and catch it by strategy. But Red was fast and smart. He would learn anything a dog would learn. Danny took him over to the pasture. The black and white cow, feet braced and head extended, stared at this newcomer into the picket domain. The mule, customarily indifferent to everything except food, ignored Red and went right on cropping the short grass. Danny swung for a short walk in the woods, and when they returned to the shanty, Ross was sitting on the table, sharpening fish hooks. He looked up. How'd he do? All right, he needs some smartening up, but he'll do good. Sure he will. You best get some sleep. Danny yawned. I just got up just four hours past. You could still sleep some more. Danny folded an old quilt and spread it on the floor near his bed. He took off his clothes and lay down, again letting his hand trail over the side of the bed and caress the big setter's back. He wasn't sleepy. A man who had slept from dawn to dark just couldn't be. Red sighed happily, and Danny wriggled on the bed. Slowly, he faded into the sound slumber until he was awakened by the sound of Red's toenails clicking on the uncarpeted floor. The big dog padded to the door, then came back to rear on the bed and nudge Danny's shoulder with his muzzle. Danny rolled over and sat up. Bright sunlight streamed through the window. A chattering flicker's strident call rattled through the morning. Danny swung out of bed, started a wood fire in the kitchen stove, and mixed pancake batter in a bowl. Ross stirred sleepily and came into the kitchen to wash his face and hands in the tin basin. They ate breakfast, and Red expertly caught the bits of pancake Danny tossed to him. Danny picked up his fork and drummed on the table's edge with its handle. You ever been to a dog show, Pappy? Nope, never have. But now that I'm older, it's often my wish that I'd gone around to see more things when I was young. Why for are you fidgeting? I don't know. Ross grinned. Put on your good clothes and pack your bag. Then get on down to Mr. Haggins. To, I'll take care of things here. I can't leave you with all the work. Nine dishes to wash off, Ross scoffed. Get going. Well, all right. Danny donned his one presentable suit of clothes, painfully knotted a bright blue tie around his throat, and packed Ross's worn carpet bag. He stood stiffly before the door with his hand on the knob. Ross glanced at him with studied unconcern. I'll see you when you come back. Good luck, Danny. Danny gulped. Thanks, Pappy. I ain't afraid. I know you ain't. New York's going to seem a funny place. But just remember that a smart hound will make out no matter where he hunts, given he keeps his nose to the wind. I'll rub a rabbit's foot for you. I'll try to do good. So long, Pappy. So long. Danny walked out the door and Red leaped happily up to pad beside him. A squirrel flashed across the trail and Red sprang at it. The squirrel ascended a tree and balanced saucily on a swaying branch while Red bounded on down the trail to overtake Danny. A buck snorted from a thicket and far down near the border of the beech woods, some of Mr. Higgins' finely bred young calves raised their heads to stare. Danny broke into the edge of the clearing and Red fell in beside him as both slowed to a sober walk. Mr. Hagen and Robert Fraley stood together near the bar. Danny came close and stood without speaking while Red sat on the ground with his back against Danny's knees. Mr. Hagen turned to smile. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, sir. Turn the dog over to Bob, will you? I want to talk with you. Yes, sir. Bob Fraley came forth with a short leather leash. Red back closer to Danny's knees and turned to look appealingly up. The overseer snapped the leash on Red's collar. 
forced him to mount a small wooden bench that stood against the barn and snapped the other end of the leash into an iron ring. He entered the barn to come out with a pair of clippers and a pair of shears. Danny looked questioningly at Mr. Hagen. He's only going to be trimmed, Mr. Hagen said. We're leaving for New York at noon. Yes, sir, Pappy told me. Mr. Hagen laughed. He did, eh? Come along, Danny. His head turned slightly so he could see red. Danny followed Mr. Hagen toward the barn door. Alert and erect, Red strained at the leash and kept his eyes on Danny. Then, just as Danny disappeared, the big red dog sighed and relaxed to let the familiar shears creep around his neck. Mr. Hagen entered a small office, sat down in a swivel chair, and motioned Danny into another room. He took a package of cigarettes from his pocket and extended them. Danny shook his head. No thanks. Pappy, he don't hold with either smoking or drinking. Mr. Hagen said thoughtfully, The more I know of your father, the more I respect him. Then, Danny, why do you suppose I turned boy over to you and am asking you to go to New York? I don't rightly know. No, I don't suppose you do. But some wise man did a neat turn with an old axiom when he said that if a man is known by the company he keeps, a company is known by the men it keeps. Throughout my whole life, I've seldom bet on anything but men, and I've seldom lost. I'm betting on you now. I don't know if I can do things for you, sir. That's my worry, Danny. I'm getting to the time of life where I can let others handle business affairs and devote my attention to the things I really like. One of those things is dogs, fine dogs, and I want you to help me. Five years from now, I expect that you'll be taking my dogs, or rather our dogs, to shows and field trials all by yourself. What do you say, Danny? I'll work very hard. I know you will, and you're going to have to work very hard. There are endless things you have to learn, and your education starts right now. I'm sending only Boy to this show, and Bob Farley's in complete charge. You're going along to learn. Now I want to ask you a question. Exactly what do you think of dog shows? They seem like a piddling waste of time, Danny confessed. Danny, you're wrong. You would be entirely right if all a dog show amounted to was a bit of ribbon or a cup or a boast in the owner's pride. But there's more than that in it, much more. In one sense, you could think of it as part of the story of man and his constant striving towards something better. A dog show is illustrative of man's achievement and a blue ribbon is more than a bit of silk. It's a mark, Danny, one that never can be erased. The dog that wins it will not die. If we send Boy to that show and he comes back as best of breed, then there's something for all future dog lovers and dog owners to build on. Don't you see, a hundred years from now, someone may stand on this very spot with fine Irish setter, and he'll trace its lineage back to some other very fine setter, perhaps to boy, and he will know that he is built on what competent men have declared to be the very best. He will know also that he too can go one step nearer the perfection that men must and will have in all things. Did not start with us, Danny, but with the first man who ever dreamed of an Irish setter. All we're trying to do is advance one step farther, and Boy's Ribbon, if he wins one, will simply be proof that we succeeded. I see, Danny breathed. I never thought of it like that before. Always think of it that way, Danny, Mr. Hagen urged. If you do, one day I'll see you as a leading dog handler. I'm sending Boy in the station wagon. I suppose you'd like to ride with him. I'd sort of like to keep him company. I thought so, Mr. Hagen laughed. When you come back at the end of the week, I'll give you your first month's wages. Wages? Yes, your beginning pay as a kennel man for me is $50 a month. I'll increase that whenever you're worth an increase. 
Gee, Mr. Hagen, that's an awful lot. Mr. Hagen said crisply, Suppose you go out and watch what Bob's doing. I'll see you in New York. Yes, sir. Danny walked out of the barn and stopped at the edge of the door to watch. Something was wrong on the wooden bench. Red was still there, and Robert Fraley was working over him with the clippers and shears. But something that Danny had seen in the big dog was no longer there. Then a little wind played around the corner of the barn, and the illusion faded. Red's head lifted. He wagged his tail and made a little lunge on the bench. Robert Fraley turned irritably around. Listen, kid, I've got orders to take you along, but I've also got orders that you're going only to watch. Don't stick your bill in unless you're a it's asked for. Danny said bluntly, I ain't aiming to bother you. He sat quietly in the grass, watching the shears work smoothly around Red's throat. Golden red hair came off in little wisps and bunches, and Robert Fraley retreated 10 feet to stand critically inspecting his work. Danny looked from the handler to the dog. Red's throat was cleaner, straighter, and the fine curves of his neck a little more pronounced. His ears, trimmed, looked a little longer than they had and clung more tightly to his head. Danny said, you left a little raggedy patch there just back of his right ear. I suppose you could do a better job. I didn't say that. I just said you left his right ear raggedy. Well, I saw that myself, kid, and I told you before not to stick your bill in until it's wanted. Robert Fraley finished trimming the ragged ear and disappeared inside the barn. Danny stole forward to pick up a tin pail that was set under a dripping faucet and gave Red a drink. The dog lapped thirstily and Danny tickled his ears with one finger while he stared resentfully at the barn. That Fraley, he might know all about dog shows and such things, but he didn't even know enough about dogs to offer one a drink on a hot day. Danny put the pail back under the faucet and retreated to his seat in the grass as Robert Fraley came out of the barn. A shining station wagon purred down from the house and a uniformed chauffeur grinned at Danny. You going, kid? Yes, sir. Well, get in. Danny said firmly, I'll wait for the dog. Well, don't say you weren't invited. Robert Fraley unsnapped Red's leash, led the big setter, Red setter to the station wagon, and permitted the leash to drag while Red climbed in to play, take his place in one of the back seats. Fraley sat down beside the chauffeur and turned to look snappishly at Danny. Are you coming? Or shall I put a leash on you too? Danny said slowly, you can try it if you're feeling awful fit. He squeezed past the front seat into the back while the station wagon purred away from Mr. Hagen's Wintappy estate down to the black top road leading to it. They went from that to Macadam and on for hour after hour while the rolling countryside swept past. Danny sat still, gazing through the window, rapidly attentive to everything. He had never been out of the wind tappy or more than 40 miles from the shanty in the beech woods. And a man didn't really know what the world was until he got out to see it. They came to a city, but the station wagon rolled right through. Late that evening, they finally crossed the Pulaski Skyway. Red slept beside him and Danny looked blankly at all the lights that seemed to be New York at night. They were everywhere, some low to the ground and some so high in the air that it was a wonder a man could climb that high to put in a light. Still puffing one of his innumerable cigarettes, the chauffeur turned around. That's the big place, kid. Yes, sir. Red stared and lifted his head in the darkness to nudge Danny's hand. Danny pulled his ears and swallowed the lump in his throat. This, exactly as Ross had said, was fine to see, but he seemed to be feeling the little breezes that played in the wind tappy at night and hearing the night sounds that drifted out of the beech forest. He belonged there along with Ross, Red, and everything else that was truly at home in the wind tappy, but 
he could still come to New York sometimes, provided Red came with him. The chauffeur threaded an expert way through the streets, weaving in and out of the traffic that clogged him, while Danny stared in wide-eyed wonder. The station wagon rolled to a stop before a big, lighted building, and without speaking, Robert Fraley got out to lead Red inside. The chauffeur lit another cigarette, shielding the match with his hand, and leaned back to puff luxuriously. Danny stared anxiously at the building into which Robert Fraley had taken Red, and looked questioningly at the chauffeur. I got orders to deliver you to Hagen's townhouse, kid, the chauffeur said. I hope the dog don't get hydrophobia and bite Fraley, but if he does, Fraley's sure going to bite you. He don't like me, Danny said gravely. I hit him in the chin. You did, the chauffeur grinned. I always miss the nicest things that happen. Are we coming back here, Danny asked anxiously. Oh, sure. Hagen will bring you back. He wants you to see the show. Don't worry about your goulash hound. He's a setter, Danny corrected. Well, don't worry about your setter then. Let's go. Again, the station wagon purred into life, and the chauffeur wove his way through crowded streets to a house that was one of a row of brownstone houses. He got out, and Danny followed with his carpet bag while the chauffeur ascended a flight of stone steps, guarded by stone lions, and pressed a button. The door opened and a butler stood framed in the light. Hi, Bill, the chauffeur remarked cheerfully. I'm back from the wilds with a wild man. Hagen said, turn him over to you. The butler said primly, Mr. Hagen has not yet arrived, but I shall be happy to care for you, sir. Will you please follow me? He reached down for Danny's bag, but Danny grinned and picked it up. I can carry my own parcels. He followed the butler through a hall and up a flight of polished stone steps into a room. Danny put his bag down and stared. The room with a canopied bed in the center was half as big as the shanty where he and Ross lived in the beech woods. Will you have dinner in your room, sir? The butler asked. Danny gulped. All this for him seemed hardly real or right. But he was hungry. A little pain assailed him. Neither he nor Red had eaten since morning, and Red was probably hungry too. Danny smiled at the butler. I'd take it right kindly if you brought me some vittles, sir. The butler smiled back, and his stiff formality seemed to leave him. Leave him. He winked at Danny. I'll bring you some. Go ahead and wash up. What would you like to eat? Ah, uh, ah, uh, pork chops are always good. The butler left and Danny entered the bathroom to wash his face and hands in the porcelain basin. For a long while, he stood pleasurably watching the cold water run out of the faucet. His mother, whom he could remember only dimly, had never had such marvels to serve her. And he and Ross got their water from a pump. But the beech woods was still a good place and a man couldn't rightly expect to have everything. He dried his face, combed his wet hair, and re-entered the bedroom to find a table set and chair ready. He ate hungrily, gnawing the last shreds of meat from the pork chops and crunching the last of a small mountain of French fried potatoes. He would, he guessed, have to learn to make such potatoes himself so Ross could enjoy them too. For a few minutes, he sat idly looking out of the window until the butler came to take the table away. Danny took off his clothes and lay down on the luxurious bed. The room seemed to whirl about. Red was looking anxiously at him, pleading with soft eyes and gently wagging tail. Danny turned over and closed his eyes to shut the vision out, but he couldn't. He sat in the darkness, resting against the bed's headboard. All he knew was that if Red was suddenly taken from him, Neither he nor Red could be happy again. That Fraley who understood the fine points of dog shows without coming even close to understanding dogs. Danny shivered and slid back down into the bed. Chapter three, the dog show. All night he lay on the soft bed sometimes dropping into a fitful doze, but for the most part, staring at the dark ceiling. 
Occasionally, his thoughts turn to Ross and the shanty in the beech woods, and at such times, Danny moved restlessly. Probably Ross would know exactly what to do and how to go about doing it, but the only parting advice he'd given Danny was that a smart hound could hunt anywhere if he kept his nose into the wind. Danny squirmed and tried to quiet the thoughts that tormented him. Mr. Hagen must have known what he was doing when he appointed Robert Friley to show the dog. Just the same. Danny remembered vividly the trimming bench in the wind tappy. Red had been under Fraley's hands then, and he had been only an animated statue instead of a dog. The wonderful thing that lived in Red that made him what he was just didn't show when Fraley was handling him. The first gray streaks of dawn stole through the windows, and outside the quiet street came to life. Danny dropped into a dream troubled sleep. He was awakened by the sound of music playing through a loud speaker in the wall and sprang up in bed. For a moment, he rubbed his eyes and looked bewildered about the room in which he found himself. Some of the notes came from the radio, were almost exactly like those of the bell-throated thrush that used to sing outside his window when early dawn came to the wind tappy. He oriented himself and swung his bare feet to the floor. This wasn't the wind tappy. It was New York. Red was here to win a blue ribbon, so that for all time to come, sportsmen who loved dogs would know how fine he was. Danny was here, if for nothing else, to cheer while he won it. He entered the bathroom and washed and was knotting the blue tie around a clean shirt he had taken out of the carpet bag when someone knocked softly on the door. It opened a crack and Mr. Hagen called cheerfully. Good morning, Danny. How goes it? Sleep well? Fine, sir. Mr. Hagen entered the room and sat down on the edge of the bed. He lit a cigarette, puffed twice on it, and pinched it out. His shoe beat a nervous little tattoo on the floor. Danny looked at him and away again. Mr. Hagen, obviously bothered by something, rose to pace around the room and again sit down on the edge of the bed. How do you like New York, he asked. I haven't seen much of it. Mr. Hagen laughed. <laughs> Good enough answer. For a moment, he was silent. Then he said, Danny, boy's going up today. And let me tell you, he's going to fight for any wins he makes. The best Irishmen in the country, and some from other countries, are here. But Danny, if boy can win his three points today, we'll have a champion. Danny knitted a puzzled brow. I thought he was that before. No, Mr. Hagen admitted. I always called him champion, and I thought of him as such. But he isn't written as a champion into the records of the American Kennel Club. You see, according to the competition he meets, a dog can win points at every show. He has to win two three-point shows under different judges and nine other points before he is officially a champion. Boy has his nine points and one three-point show. He can win five points at this show. He's got to win three. How are such things rated, Danny asked. By the general excellence of the dog. A judge will examine his head, eyes, ears, neck, body, shoulders, and forelegs, hind legs, tail, coat, and feathering, color, size, style, and general appearance, and rate him accordingly. If two dogs are equal physically, the one with the most dog personality will win. I want you to watch the judge and the handlers with their dogs and ask me any questions you care to while the judging is in progress. You'll learn that way, Danny. Danny, boy's as good as any iris setter in the show. I know that, sir. Mr. Hagen was looking at him, and Danny felt strangely drawn to the older man. They were not a wealthy dog fancier and his apprentice handler, but two men who could be brought very close by a common bond, the love of a good dog. Danny licked his dry lips. You could get all the best dogs from all over and have every hair in place on every one of them. And if they were all exactly alike, 
two or three would still stand out, and one would stand out from those. That thing Mr. Hagen had referred to as dog personality. Maybe every dog had it, but had no reason for revealing it. Do you suppose we can see red before the show? Danny asked. Mr. Hagen coughed nervously and looked away. <clears throat> I'm afraid not. Bob always likes to handle a dog without interference, especially on show day. You can see him right after the show. Yes, sir. Come on down and have some breakfast, Mr. Hagen urged. We'll both feel better. Doggone it, Danny. I'm as nervous as a 16-year-old going sparking for the first time. They ate, and Mr. Hagen retreated to an inner office to conduct some business of his own while Danny roamed about the house. Pictures of horses and dogs lined the walls of one big room, and on the mantelpiece, Danny found a small folder containing one worn snapshot. It was a 15-year-old boy with bare feet thrust out of tattered overalls and a cane pole in one hand and a string of sunfish in the other. Danny peered closely at it and held it up to the light. When he replaced it on the mantel, he knew that it was a boyhood picture of Mr. Hagen. The lord of this luxurious manor and the great Wintapia estate had not then always been wealthy. Danny sat down on the sofa, looking about at the books, the pictures, the trophies, all the things, all throughout the years that Mr. Hagen had gathered. He leaned back to close his eyes and thought curiously that he was no longer the same person who had come out of the Wintappy. He had learned, and with added knowledge, seemed to have grown. He thought of Red, and his eyes glowed. Back in the Wintappy, no matter what it looked like, a dog was esteemed according to his hunting ability. But to have a dog with hunting ability, and all the brains, the courage, and the heart that a dog like Red had too, if such dogs came about as a result of competitive dog shows, then certainly only a fool would scoff at or belittle them. Danny's eyes clouded and again he seemed to see Red beside him, in trouble and needing help. He rose to pace about the room, peering into the wall cases at Mr. Hagen's books and trophies. If only he was back in the Wintappy, he would know exactly what to do, and nobody could tell him that he was just an onlooker. Danny clenched and unclenched his hand. Try as he would to please Mr. Hagen, he could not feel like just an onlooker here either. Red had something great at stake, and Danny must help him triumph. It was an eternity before the butler came in to announce lunch. Mr. Hagen was more composed, but an excited little light that he could not control still danced in the back of his eyes. Danny ate broiled steak, mashed potatoes, asparagus, and a wonderful kind of pudding that floated in whipped cream. He made a mental note to inquire that kind of pudding so he could make some for Ross when he got back to the wind tappy. He looked up as Mr. Hagen started to speak. As I've already told you, Danny, the basic idea of a dog show is to determine the best dogs. It's really an elimination contest, with the inferior dogs being weeded out and the best ones winning the awards. Naturally, you can't take 75 dogs, throw them all together and pick out the best. So the dogs are divided into classes. The puppy class is open to any qualified dog more than six months and less than a year old. No imported dog, except those from Canada, may be entered in that class. The novice class is open to any dog that has not won a first prize at an American Kennel Club show, and a surprise winner often comes from it. The limit class is open to any dog except AKC champions, and the imported dogs may enter it. The winner's class, of course, determines the best of winners. As a general rule, in all of these classes, Dogs and bitches are judged separately. Do you know why? I think so, Danny answered gravely. They aren't alike. A dog wants to be big, strong, and husky, same as a man. A bitch can be strong, but there's the same difference between them as there is between a woman and a man. It would be hard to judge them together. 
That's right, Mr. Hagen nodded approvingly. Although, of course, the winner's dog competes with the winner's bitch for best of breed. But there's another class, the Open, and boys entered in that. The Open's where you usually find the hottest competition, and it's certainly here this time. Imported dogs may enter, and Art Mogan came from London with Heather Bloom. Mr. Hagen closed his eyes. Wait until you see Heather Bloom, Danny. He moves like a flame, and except for Boy, is the finest Irish setter I've ever seen. Are there any questions you'd like to ask? I can't rightly think of any, Danny admitted. Probably I will after I've seen the show. Then let's go. Every man has a right to his own private superstitions, and I'd like to go in just as Boy's going into the ring. He needs luck and we should time it just about right if we leave now. They went out the front door and entered a sleek black limousine that waited there. The chauffeur drove off while Mr. Hagen relaxed in the back seat with his eyes closed. Danny looked out the window, eagerly drinking in all the things that were New York by day. He missed nothing from the blue uniformed policemen at intersections to the newsboys who scooted along the sidewalks. The chauffeur stopped suddenly and Danny looked ahead to see a uniformed officer directing traffic down a side street. Bright red fire trucks were huddled on the street from which they had been shunted and smoke rolled from the fourth story of a building there. Mr. Hagen muttered to himself and looked at his watch. Finally, the car rolled to a stop before the big building. Danny recognized it even by daylight into which Robert Fraley had taken red. He gulped and tried to quiet the frightened little butterflies that were in his stomach. It was a huge building, big as all the buildings in the Wintappy, including Mr. Hagen's barns, and he didn't even know his way into it. He got out with Mr. Hagen and the chauffeur drove away down the street while they joined one of the lines of people moving through the doors. From somewhere, Danny faintly heard the frenzied barking of a dog that was either excited or in distress. He listened attentively, but it wasn't red. Close behind Mr. Hagen, he passed down an aisle to take his seat directly before one of two dog rings. Almost as soon as he sat down, he saw red. The dog had a short leather leash around his neck and was walking to the left of Robert Fraley around the ring. Danny skipped the 13 dogs whose handlers were also gating them for the judge and fastened his eyes on red. His fingernails bit deeply into the palms of his hands, and his knuckles whitened. It had happened, exactly what he had feared most. The dog in the ring was not the one that had come wagging up to greet him, the dog of the wind tappy. He was not the red Danny knew, but only an animated plaything that walked around the ring because he had been taught to do so. Beads of sweat gathered on Danny's brow. A tiny piece of paper, borne by a gentle wind current, whirled over the wing, ring and settled on the floor of the amphitheater 20 feet beyond it. Three of the dogs looked at it, but Red did not. Danny tore his eyes away from his idol to look at the other dogs. He swallowed hard. Never before had he seen so many magnificent dogs. Unless he had seen them, it would be hard to believe that there were that many. His eyes skipped over two whose feet turned out slightly at the past turn and whose gait was in a very slight degree erratic as compared to Red and the rest of the setters in the ring. He looked sideways at Mr. Hagen and tried to keep from looking back into the ring, but he couldn't. His eyes were arrested by the third dog behind Red, a rich golden chestnut with a narrow white blaze down his face. The dog at first glance seemed almost as magnificent as Red. He was big with a long neck and lean head. His front legs were very straight and strong with beautifully symmetrical feathering flowing from them as he walked. His feet were tight, strong, and small. His chest deep with ribs well spread for lung space. Long loins had a nice tuck up before strong rear legs. His tail extending slightly downward, waved gently as he walked. Danny nudged Mr. Hagen and whispered, 
Is that third one behind red, Heather Bloom? It is, Mr. Hagen said. I told you he was magnificent. He sure is, Danny breathed. Another wisp of paper blew across the amphitheater as the dogs were lined up, head to tail before the judge. Danny saw the judge confer with the two handlers whose dogs turned out at the past turn, and one of them led his dog around the ring again. Then both withdrew their entries. Danny looked approvingly at the judge. Such a defeat wasn't easy to see, but if a show was to determine a dog's perfection, then it was right that these two be withdrawn. The judge knelt beside the first dog in the row and opened his mouth. Danny saw white teeth flash and thought he saw the lower jaw protruding slightly ahead of the upper. He whispered to Mr. Hagen, That dog looks undershot. Mr. Hagen grinned. Maybe I should ask you questions. Where'd you learn the AKC rules, Danny? I didn't, but a body knows what's the matter with a dog. Fifteen dollars is a right smart heap of money to spend for a hound if you get one that can't run or bite or has no wind. A body's got to look for things in a dog. The judge ran his hands over the dog's head and ears, on down the neck, and over the chest, while the handler knelt at the rear, pulling gently on the tail. The judge moved to the rear, and the handler stepped quickly in front of the dog to grasp his head firmly and extend it. He's showing the neckline, Mr. Hagen explained, and steadying the dog. The judge returned to the front, picked the dog up under the chest, and dropped him easily to the floor. Then he moved to the next dog, while the handler knelt before the one that had already been examined and stroked his charge. The judge went on down the line, and Danny watched wildly as he bent over red. The big dog posed perfectly. His front legs and feet were set perpendicular on the floor, and from the hock down, his rear legs were also perpendicular. His neck stretched up and forward. His head and muzzle were level and parallel with the floor, and his tail sloped gently downward. But there was still something missing, something that should be there and was not. The judge finished the last dog, and at a little trot, the first handler ran his dog around the ring. He stopped, and again, the judge knelt to examine the dog's jaw. The handler led his dog back to the bench, and one by one, the rest of the handlers gated their dogs. Danny leaned excitedly forward. Heather Bloom, Red, and two dogs that Danny could not identify were up for the final judging. Mr. Hagen had said that Red needed luck. Danny crossed his fingers. But when he looked over his left shoulder to split, he looked directly into the eyes of a fat and perspiring man behind him. Danny flushed and swung around to watch while beads of perspiration gathered on his forehead. These four dogs were the best of all that had been entered in the open class, but the best of the four. Danny stared beseechingly at Red. Still an animated and beautiful statue under the expert hands of Robert Fraley. Heather Bloom lifted his head to look imperiously at the judge and sweep the spectators with a commanding eye. Danny sucked in his breath, and once more his fingers bit deeply into the palms of his hands. The dog from England was alive, alert, challenging everyone to dare to do anything but give him the blue ribbon. But he was still not so alive and alert as Danny had seen red. Danny gripped the front of his seat as though the very intensity of his will and thought would carry to red the message that Danny wanted him to have. The judge leaned over red and passed on to Heather Bloom. Danny said suddenly, I'll be back, sir. He rose and ran along the narrow corridor before the seats while people stared curiously at him and an usher made as if to stop him. Danny ran on unheeding and uncaring. Finally, he stopped in an aisle to stand and stare breathlessly back toward the ring, and he saw a miracle. Red came suddenly alive. Physically, he was the dog that Robert Fraley had led into the ring, but there was something about him now that had not been there before. Red was once more the dog of the wind tappy. The glorious dog that Danny had first seen when he went down to report to Mr. Hagen 
that the outlaw bear had killed another of his bulls. Danny saw the judge smile and hand the blue winner's ribbon to Robert Fraley. For a while, Danny stood very still, watching the happy dog in the ring strain toward him. Ross had said that a smart hound could hunt anywhere if he kept his nose into the wind. And Ross was right. The pieces of paper blowing across the amphitheater had shown Danny which way the wind was blowing. All he had to do was go stand in the wind current and let his scent be carried by it to prove to the dog that the boy he worshipped was standing by. Chapter 4, Danny's Humiliation For three happy days, Danny wandered about the amphitheater whenever Robert Fraley was absent, stopping at Red's bench, and when Fraley was present, drifting about to study with fascinated eyes the many marvels that offered. He saw dogs the like of which he had never dreamed of before.